The Greek alphabet was inspired by an abjad used by Phoenician merchants. But how else did the Phoenicians influence classical Greek culture? I'm Kanaz Vilan, and this is the untold 15-minute story of the Phoenicians and the Greeks. Now, on my Facebook page, I asked my friends for suggested topics. I got multiple requests for episodes on Phoenicians. Got requests for a few other topics as well, but I figured I'd start with the number one in popularity, and that is Phoenicians. So, who are these people who gave us literacy but wound up best remembered for sacrificing babies? Now, the Phoenicians definitely deserve a few episodes, but for right now, let's start with the question of who they were and where they came from. The first thing we have to realize, Phoenician was what they call an exonym. That's a name the Greeks gave these people. It came from a purple dye they made from sea snails. But we'll talk about that more. The Phoenicians considered themselves Canaanites. The language Phoenicians spoke is very similar to Aramaic, Hebrew, and other Western Semitic dialects. And but while the Phoenicians considered themselves Canaanites in a general sense, their primary social identity revolved around their city or their colony. This was pretty much standard for the Bronze Age. Now, the Greeks considered themselves Hellenes in a loose sense, and there was this idea of Hellenistic culture, but Spartans, Athenians, and Thebans, just to name three, had very, very different cultures, and more often than not, those cultures had long historic grudges. So what did the Phoenicians do? Well, they were among the earliest glass workers. The jury's still out on whether the Phoenicians or the Egyptians were the first to actually create and sell glass. But we know the Phoenicians were also masters of dye making. Again, it's that sea snail dye they made was called Tyrian purple. It was they called it taking the purple when you became a Roman emperor for a reason, and it, that purple came from Phoenician merchants. We also know that during the Bronze Age, the Phoenicians had flat bottom boats, and they were making short voyages close to the shore, on the Levant, and into some of the islands, as early as the Bronze Age, where they would come into port, they'd sell merchandise, you know, more precisely, they'd barter for whatever it was the natives had. They would then come back home and sell that and profit from the way they, they were a tribe of traveling merchants. And these sailing merchants got caught up in the late Bronze Age collapse. I've mentioned that in the previous two episodes. They came out of the early 12th century BC chaos better than their neighbors did. In fact, Phoenician sailing ability picks up dramatically from the 11th century BC onward. When the Sea Peoples came in on their attack, they came in sailing in keeled boats. Now, a keeled boat is easier to steer than a flat bottom boat it's more stable in a swell this increased the potential range where phoenicians could sail the phoenicians picked up this technology and they started expanding their range until you could find you still can find today phoenician settlements all along the coast of the mediterranean and as you know i'm going to mention later well beyond the mediterranean the Phoenicians were mostly traders. They spent their time buying and selling goods around the region when they sailed into their home ports. They were more likely to trade with the indigenous locals than fight them. You often saw wealthy Phoenicians marrying into the local nobility. And in fact, there was a famous legend where a heroic Phoenician named Cadmus taught a benighted nation how to read and write. Now, we hear about Cadmus in the Histories of Herodotus. This was written in the 5th century BC. In that book, Herodotus estimates that Cadmus 
brought the alphabet to the region around 1600 years earlier. You know, that would be around 2000 BC. And Herodotus believed that this all happened while Cadmus was searching for his sister Europa. Europa was carried off from her home in Tyre, a Phoenician city, by Zeus to Crete. Zeus seduced her while he was in the form of a white bull. Europa goes on to become a great Cretan queen. She later becomes a Cretan deity. Cadmus winds up following another cow with a moon on her haunch, and that cow was sent by Athena. That cow lays down to rest in the territory that would later become the Greek city of Thebes. Now, Archaeological evidence makes it pretty clear Herodotus got the dates wrong, but what's really illuminating is his mistake because that mistake suggests that by the 5th century BC, the earlier linear syllabic systems, the linear B, the language that was being used in the Minoan and the Mycenaean courts, that was completely forgotten by the 5th century BC. At that point, Greeks had been literate, had become literate again with the Phoenician alphabet for about 300 years. And even the Hellenic world's most educated men, and Herodotus was certainly one of the Hellenic world's most educated men, believed the Greeks had always used their current alphabet. They knew their current alphabet was a revamped version of the Phoenician alphabet. They also knew that the Phoenicians had a long history, in fact, a history that was considerably longer than the Mycenaean history. Europa and Cadmus were supposed to be from the nobility of Tyr, and Tyr is a city that was 1,500 years old when the first Mycenaean palaces were built. Now, it's hard to say whether or not Thebes was actually founded or ruled by a Phoenician centuries before the Trojan War, but we can say with certainty the Greek alphabet, and from the Greek alphabet, the Latin and the Cyrillic alphabets, are derived from the Phoenician alphabet. We do know that the Phoenicians set up colonies. We also know that they set up a colony on Cyprus around this beginning around the 10th century that gave us the founding father of Stoicism. I know Stoicism is the classic Greek and the classic Roman philosophy, but the founding father of Stoicism was actually a Phoenician. That Phoenician's name is Zeno of Kittium. Kittium was home to a Tyrian colony. That colony was established sometime in the late 10th to early 9th centuries BC. Cyprus has a lot of copper. One of the first big things the Phoenicians traded, one of the things that they got really wealthy on was the copper trade. Cyprus had a lot of copper, so they wanted to get control of the area where you know, the, the resources were coming from. And Cyprus is also strategically located between the Levant, between Tyr, Sidon, between the, the Canaanites on the east. If you go to the northwest, you could sail into Greece which was at this point, you know, a like a growing economy, maybe slowly growing, not as big as it had been during the Mycenaean times, but they were starting to pick up. And then to the south, you could sail into Egypt and into the Nile, and you could take advantage of those markets. And while the colony on Kittium on Cyprus never got quite as big as the most famous Phoenician colony, of course, that would be Carthage, Kittium was ruled by Phoenician kings, and they preserved a lot of their Tyrian traditions. They also preserved the Phoenician language. Now, at the time, Zeno is about a century after Herodotus, who I just mentioned. So we're talking now the 4th century BC. At this time, 
Medes, Gideon, and the Cyprus had been ruled by the Persians, and the things had gone pretty well with the Persians. There were three groups on Gideon, uh, on Cyprus. There was Gideon, which was a Phoenician colony. You had an indigenous Cypriot community, which claimed descent from the Minoans, and you had an Aegean Greek community, and they were all living together there on Cyprus. And then, around 332, not long after Zeno's birth, Kidium gained its freedom from the Persian Empire. And then in 312, Egypt was in the hands of a Greek who had been, who'd fought with Alexander. His name is Ptolemy. He founds the Ptolemaic d dynasty of pharaohs, the last dynasty of Egyptian pharaohs. He goes, he takes Cyprus by force. Pumiathan, who was the king, like king who was ruling over the city area of Kition, is murdered by Egyptian soldiers. And now Ptolemy, when he takes over Cyprus, starts this policy of Hellenization. You know, they, we were speaking multiple languages here. We had multiple cultures. Cyprus going forward is going to be Greek and everything is going to be done in, in Greek. And one of the people who wound up a refugee from this is a 22-year-old Phoenician merchant named Zeno. He winds up in Athens, you know, in the wake of the fall of Kidion. And he's the, you know, he had been there on family business. He's killing time in an Athens bookshop. And he discovers the works of Xenophon, who's a student of Sophocles. From that moment forward, Zeno devotes his life to philosophy. He studies with several cynical philosophers. He's impressed by their idea the enlightened man should live in a way so as not to be troubled by misfortune. But he also felt some of their more extreme acts of asceticism were counterproductive. And so he started teaching his own brand of philosophy on the porch or the stoa of the arcade in the Athens marketplace. Zeno and his students, the Stoics, aimed at a state of mind where you could fulfill your duties to the people and to your peers. And to that end, Zeno reminds us all things are transient, suffering and joys alike will end and in place of a reactive life that's ruled entirely by emotion and sensation, Zeno advocated a life ruled by reason, a life lived in the world but not of the world. And some of you may think this sounds like Buddhism. Lots of people have noticed elements of Buddhist thought and Stoicism and lots of people have tried to find links between the two movements. Now, Zeno is teaching about 50 years before India's Mauryan Emperor Ak Ashoka starts sending out Buddhist missionaries to the eastern parts of Alexander's empire. We know those missionaries were very successful. There were Indo-Greek Buddhist empires for centuries after Alexander conquered the East. You know, we know that many of the ideas that Zeno preached were also found in pre-Socratic philosophers who predated Siddhartha Gautama by a century or more. You know, and again, like I said, the missionaries who visited the Greco-Bactrian kingdoms of Central Asia, that's the places where Alexander had conquered you, know, those missionaries were remarkably successful. The Bactrian rulers converted to Buddhism and began building these absolutely beautiful statues of Siddhartha using you know, Greek sculpting technology. Before this, you didn't really see a lot of human images of Buddha, but after the Bactrians, wherever you see Buddhism spring up, you start seeing statues of the Buddha. And art historians have long recognized that Greek influence on Buddhist art. I really wonder, you know, you know, we wonder how much Buddhism influenced Greek philosophy. Maybe we should consider how much early Greek philosophy helped shape the development of Buddhism. You know, or it's also possible this was a case of coevolution. Zeno was born 
at the tail end of Phoenician domination in the Mediterranean. This is a time when relations between the Phoenicians and their Greek and Roman neighbors are getting increasingly hostile. You know, it's not hard to understand how you've got a once wealthy Phoenician refugee of a philosophical bent could become enlightened as to the world's transience and unfairness and seek solutions for how to deal with that world. So that could happen. Now, why were things getting so tense for Phoenicians? And that answer to that question lies in the history of Phoenicia's greatest colony. It's the big naval power that nearly conquered the Roman Empire. It's the city the Phoenicians called Carthage. The Romans called it Carthago. Of course, we call it Carthage. That's the story we'll be covering next week. And yes, we will be talking about the sacrifice of babies to Moloch. This has been Ancient History in 15 Minutes, and I'm Kanaz Filan. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to like and subscribe.